Section 22 of the Expression of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Chapter 12. Surprise, Astonishment, Fear, Horror. Part 2. Dr. J. Crichton Brown has given me so striking an account of intense fear in an insane woman aged 35 that the description, though painful, ought not to be omitted. When a paroxysm seizes her, she screams out, This is hell! There is a black woman! I can't get out! And other such exclamations. When thus screaming, her movements are those of alternate tension and tremor. For one instant, she clenches her hands, holds her arms out before her in a stiff, semi-flexed position, then suddenly bends her body forwards, sways rapidly to and fro, draws her fingers through her hair, clutches at her neck, and tries to tear off her clothes. The sternocleidomastoid muscles, which serve to bend the head on the chest, stand out prominently, as if swollen, and the skin in front of them is much wrinkled. Her hair, which is cut short at the back of her head and is smooth when she is calm, now stands on end, that in front being disheveled by the movements of her hands. The countenance expresses great mental agony. The skin is flushed over the face and neck, down to the clavicles, and the veins of the forehead and neck stand out like thick cords. The lower lip drops and is somewhat everted. The mouth is kept half open, with the lower jaw projecting. The cheeks are hollow and deeply furrowed in curved lines, running from the wings of the nostrils to the corners of the mouth. The nostrils themselves are raised and extended. The eyes are widely opened, and beneath them the skin appears swollen. The pupils are large. The forehead is wrinkled transversely in many folds, and at the inner extremities of the eyebrows it is strongly furrowed in diverging lines, produced by the powerful and persistent contraction of the corrugators. Mr. Bell has also described an agony of terror and of despair, which he witnessed in a murderer whilst carried to the place of execution in Turin. On each side of the car the officiating priests were seated, and in the center sat the criminal himself. It was impossible to witness the condition of this unhappy wretch without terror, and yet, as if impelled by some strange infatuation, it was equally impossible not to gaze upon an object so wild, so full of horror. He seemed about thirty-five years of age, of large and muscular form, his countenance marked by strong and savage features, half-naked, pale as death, agonized with terror, every limb strained in anguish, his hands clenched convulsively, the sweat breaking out on his bent and contracted brow. He kissed incessantly the figure of our Savior, painted on the flag which was suspended before him, but with an agony of wildness and despair, of which nothing ever exhibited on the stage can give the slightest conception. I will add only one other case, illustrative of a man utterly prostrated by terror. An atrocious murderer of two persons was brought into a hospital under the mistaken impression that he had poisoned himself and Dr. W. Ogle carefully watched him the next morning while he was being handcuffed and taken away by the police. His pallor was extreme, and his prostration so great that he was hardly able to dress himself. His skin perspired, and his eyelids and head drooped so much that it was impossible to catch even a glimpse of his eyes. His lower jaw hung down. There was no contraction of any facial muscle, and Dr. Ogle is almost certain that the hair did not stand on end, for he observed it narrowly, as it had been dyed for the sake of concealment. With respect to fear, as exhibited by the various races of man, my informants agree that the signs are the same as with Europeans. They are displayed in an exaggerated degree with the Hindus and natives of Ceylon. Mr. Geach has seen Malays when terrified turn pale and shake, and Mr. Bro Smith states that a native Australian, being on one occasion much frightened, showed a complexion as nearly approaching to what we call paleness, as can well be conceived in the case of a very black man. Mr. Dyson Lacey has seen extreme fear shown in an Australian, 
by a nervous twitching of the hands, feet, and lips, and by the perspiration standing on the skin. Many savages do not repress the signs of fear so much as Europeans, and they often tremble greatly. With the kafir, Gaika says, in his rather quaint English, the shaking of the body is much experienced, and the eyes are widely open. With savages, the sphincter muscles are often relaxed, just as may be observed in much frightened dogs, and as I have seen with monkeys when terrified by being caught. The Erection of the Hair Some of the signs of fear deserve a little further consideration. Poets continually speak of the hair standing on end. Brutus says to the ghost of Caesar, That makes my blood cold and my hair to stare. And Cardinal Beaufort, after the murder of Gloucester, exclaims, Comb down his hair. Look, look, it stands upright. As I did not feel sure whether writers of fiction might not have applied to man what they had often observed in animals, I begged for information from Dr. Crichton Brown with respect to the insane. He states in answer that he has repeatedly seen their hair erected under the influence of sudden and extreme terror. For instance, it is occasionally necessary to inject morphia under the skin of an insane woman who dreads the operation extremely, although it causes very little pain, for she believes that poison is being introduced into her system and that her bones will be softened and her flesh turned to dust. She becomes deadly pale, her limbs are stiffened by a sort of tetanic spasm, and her hair is partially erected on the front of the head. Dr. Brown further remarks that the bristling of the hair, which is so common in the insane, is not always associated with terror. It is perhaps most frequently seen in chronic maniacs, who rave incoherently and have destructive impulses, but it is during their paroxysms of violence that the bristling is most observable. The fact of the hair becoming erect under the influence both of rage and fear agrees perfectly with what we have seen in the lower animals. Dr. Brown adduces several cases in evidence. Thus with a man now in the asylum, before the recurrence of each maniacal paroxysm, the hair rises up from his forehead like the mane of a Shetland pony. He has sent me photographs of two women taken in the intervals between their paroxysms, and he adds with respect to one of these women that the state of her hair is a sure and convenient criterion of her mental condition. I have had one of these photographs copied, and the engraving gives, if viewed from a little distance, a faithful representation of the original, with the exception that the hair appears rather too coarse and too much curled. The extraordinary condition of the hair in the insane is due, not only to its erection, but to its dryness and harshness, consequent on the subcutaneous glands failing to act. Dr. Bucknell has said that a lunatic is a lunatic to his finger's ends. He might have added, and often to the extremity of each particular hair. Dr. Brown mentions as an empirical confirmation of the relation which exists in the insane between the state of their hair and minds that the wife of a medical man who has charge of a lady suffering from acute melancholia with a strong fear of death for herself, her husband, and children reported verbally to him the day before receiving my letter as follows. I think Mrs. will soon improve for her hair is getting smooth, and I always notice that our patients get better whenever their hair ceases to be rough and unmanageable. Dr. Brown attributes the persistently rough condition of the hair in many insane patients in part to their minds being always somewhat disturbed, and in part to the effects of habit, that is, to the hair being frequently and strongly erected during their many recurrent paroxysms. In patients in whom the bristling of the hair is extreme, the disease is generally permanent and mortal, but in others in whom the bristling is moderate, as soon as they recover their health of mind, the hair recovers its smoothness. In a previous chapter, we have seen that with animals, the hairs are erected 
by the contraction of minute, unstriped, and involuntary muscles, which run to each separate follicle. In addition to this action, Mr. J. Wood has clearly ascertained by experiment, as he informs me, that with man the hairs on the front of the head, which slope forwards, and those on the back, which slope backwards, are raised in opposite directions by the contraction of the occipitofrontalis, or scalp muscle, so that this muscle seems to aid in the erection of the hairs on the head of man in the same manner as the homologous paniculus carnosus aids, or takes the greater part in the erection of the spines on the backs of some of the lower animals. Contraction of the platysma myoides muscle. This muscle is spread over the sides of the neck, extending downwards to a little beneath the collarbones and upwards to the lower part of the cheeks. A portion called the risorius is represented in the woodcut. The contraction of this muscle draws the corners of the mouth and the lower parts of the cheeks downwards and backwards. It produces at the same time divergent longitudinal prominent ridges on the sides of the neck and the young, and in old thin persons fine transverse wrinkles. This muscle is sometimes said not to be under the control of the will, but almost every one, if told to draw the corners of his mouth backwards and downwards with great force, brings it into action. I have, however, heard of a man who can voluntarily act on it only on one side of his neck. Sir C. Bell and others have stated that this muscle is strongly contracted under the influence of fear, and Duchesne insists so strongly on its importance in the expression of this emotion that he calls it the muscle of fright. He admits, however, that its contraction is quite inexpressive unless associated with widely open eyes and mouth. He has given a photograph, copied and reduced in the accompanying woodcut, of the same old man as on former occasions, with his eyebrows strongly raised, his mouth opened, and the platysma contracted, all by means of galvanism. The original photograph was shown to 24 persons, and they were separately asked, without any explanation being given, what expression was intended. Twenty instantly answered, intense fright, or horror. Three said, pain, and one, extreme discomfort. Dr. Duchesne has given another photograph of the same old man with the platysma contracted, the eyes and mouth opened, and the eyebrows rendered oblique by means of galvanism. The expression thus induced is very striking, the obliquity of the eyebrows adding the appearance of great mental distress. The original was shown to 15 persons, 12 answered terror or horror, and 3 agony or great suffering. From these cases and from an examination of the other photographs given by Dr. Duchesne, together with his remarks thereon, I think there can be little doubt that the contraction of the platysma does add greatly to the expression of fear. Nevertheless, this muscle ought hardly to be called that of fright, for its contraction is certainly not a necessary concomitant of this state of mind. A man may exhibit extreme terror in the plainest manner by death-like power, by drops of perspiration on his skin, and by utter prostration with all the muscles of his body, including the platysma, completely relaxed. Although Dr. Brown has often seen this muscle quivering and contracting in the insane, he has not been able to connect its action with any emotional condition in them. Though he carefully attended to patients suffering from great fear, Mr. Nicole, on the other hand, has observed three cases in which this muscle appeared to be more or less permanently contracted under the influence of melancholia associated with much dread, but in one of these cases various other muscles about the neck and head were subject to spasmodic contractions. Dr. W. Ogle observed for me in one of the London hospitals about 20 patients just before they were put under the influence of chloroform for operations. 
They exhibited some trepidation, but no great terror. In only four of the cases was the platysma visibly contracted, and it did not begin to contract until the patients began to cry. The muscles seemed to contract at the moment of each deep-drawn inspiration, so that it is very doubtful whether the contraction depended at all on the emotion of fear. In a fifth case, the patient who was not chloroformed was much terrified, and his platysma was more forcibly and persistently contracted than in the other cases. But even here there is room for doubt, for the muscle, which appeared to be unusually developed, was seen by Dr. Ogle to contract as the man moved his head from the pillow after the operation was over. As I felt much perplexed why, in any case, a superficial muscle on the neck should be especially affected by fear, I applied to my many obliging correspondents for information about the contraction of this muscle under other circumstances. It would be superfluous to give all the answers which I have received. They show that this muscle acts, often in a variable manner and degree, under many different conditions. It is violently contracted in hydrophobia, and in a somewhat less degree in lockjaw, sometimes in a marked manner during the insensibility from chloroform. Dr. W. Ogle observed two male patients suffering from such difficulty in breathing that the trachea had to be opened, and in both the platysma was strongly contracted. One of these men overheard the conversation of the surgeons surrounding him, and when he was able to speak, declared that he had not been frightened. In some other cases of extreme difficulty of respiration, though not requiring tracheotomy, observed by doctors Ogle and Langstaff, the platysma was not contracted. Mr. J. Wood, who has studied with such care the muscles of the human body, as shown by his various publications, has often seen the platysma contracting in vomiting, nausea, and disgust, also in children and adults under the influence of rage, for instance, in Irish women, quarreling and brawling together with angry gesticulations. This may possibly have been due to their high and angry tones, for I know a lady, an excellent musician, who, in singing certain high notes, always contracts her platysma. So does a young man, as I have observed, in sounding certain notes on the flute. Mr. J. Wood informs me that he has found the platysma best developed in persons with thick necks and broad shoulders, and that in families inheriting these peculiarities, its development is usually associated with much voluntary power over the homologous occipitofrontalis muscle, by which the scalp can be moved. None of the foregoing cases appear to throw any light on the contraction of the platysma from fear, but it is different, I think, with the following cases. The gentleman before referred to who can voluntarily act on this muscle only on one side of his neck is positive that it contracts on both sides whenever he is startled. Evidence has already been given showing that this muscle sometimes contracts, perhaps for the sake of opening the mouth widely, when the breathing is rendered difficult by disease, and during the deep inspirations of crying fits before an operation. Now, whenever a person starts at any sudden sight or sound, he instantaneously draws a deep breath, and thus the contraction of the platysma may possibly have become associated with the sense of fear. But there is, I believe, a more efficient relation. The first sensation of fear or the imagination of something dreadful commonly excites a shudder. I have caught myself giving a little involuntary shudder at a painful thought, and I distinctly perceived that my platysma contracted. So it does if I simulate a shudder. I have asked others to act in this manner, and in some the muscle contracted, but not in others. One of my sons, whilst getting out of bed, shuddered from the cold, and as he happened to have his hand on his neck, he plainly felt that this muscle strongly contracted. He then voluntarily shuddered, as he had done on former occasions, but the platysma was not then affected. 
Mr. J. Wood has also several times observed this muscle contracting in patients when stripped for examination and who were not frightened but shivered slightly from the cold. Unfortunately, I have not been able to ascertain whether, when the whole body shakes, as in the cold stage of an ague fit, the platysma contracts. But as it certainly often contracts during a shudder, and as a shudder or shiver often accompanies the first sensation of fear, we have, I think, a clue to its action in this latter case. Its contraction, however, is not an invariable concomitant of fear, for it probably never acts under the influence of extreme prostrating terror. Dilation of the pupils. Gratiolet repeatedly insists that the pupils are enormously dilated whenever terror is felt. I have no reason to doubt the accuracy of this statement, but have failed to obtain confirmatory evidence excepting in the one instance before given of an insane woman suffering from great fear. When writers of fiction speak of the eyes being widely dilated, I presume that they refer to the eyelids. Monroe's statement that with parrots the iris is affected by the passions, independently of the amount of light, seems to bear on this question. But Professor Donders informs me that he has often seen movements in the pupils of these birds which he thinks may be related to their power of accommodation to distance, in nearly the same manner as our own pupils contract when our eyes converge for near vision. Gratiolet remarks that the dilated pupils appear as if they were gazing into profound darkness. No doubt the fears of man have often been excited in the dark, but hardly so often or so exclusively as to account for a fixed and associated habit having thus arisen. It seems more probable, assuming that Gratiolet's statement is correct, that the brain is directly affected by the powerful emotion of fear and reacts on the pupils. But Professor Donders informs me that this is an extremely complicated subject. I may add, as possibly throwing light on the subject, that Dr. Fife of Netley Hospital has observed in two patients that the pupils were distinctly dilated during the cold stage of an ague fit. Professor Donders has also seen dilation of the pupils in incipient faintness. Horror. The state of mind expressed by this term implies terror and is in some cases almost synonymous with it. Many a man must have felt before the blessed discovery of chloroform great horror at the thought of an impending surgical operation. He who dreads as well as hates a man will feel, as Milton uses the word, a horror of him. We feel horror if we see any one, for instance a child, exposed to some instant and crushing danger. Almost everyone would experience the same feeling in the highest degree in witnessing a man being tortured or going to be tortured. In these cases, there is no danger to ourselves, but from the power of the imagination and of sympathy, we put ourselves in the position of the sufferer and feel something akin to fear. Sir C. Bell remarks that horror is full of energy. The body is in the utmost tension, not unnerved by fear. It is therefore probable that horror would generally be accompanied by the strong contraction of the brows. But as fear is one of the elements, the eyes and mouth would be opened and the eyebrows would be raised, as far as the antagonistic action of the corrugators permitted this movement. Duchesne has given a photograph of the same old man as before, with his eyes somewhat staring, the eyebrows partially raised, and at the same time strongly contracted, the mouth opened, and the platysma in action all affected by the means of galvanism. He considers that the expression thus produced shows extreme terror with horrible pain or torture. A tortured man, as long as his sufferings allow him to feel any dread for the future, would probably exhibit horror in an extreme degree. I have shown the original of this photograph to 23 persons of both sexes and various ages, 
and 13 immediately answered horror, great pain, torture, or agony. Three answered extreme fright, so that 16 answered nearly in accordance with Duchenne's belief. Six, however, said anger, guided no doubt by the strongly contracted brows, and overlooking the peculiarly open mouth. One said disgust. On the whole, the evidence indicates that we have here a fairly good representation of horror and agony. The photograph before referred to likewise exhibits horror, but in this, the oblique eyebrows indicate great mental distress in place of energy. Horror is generally accompanied by various gestures which differ in different individuals. Judging from pictures, the whole body is often turned away or shrinks, or the arms are violently protruded as if to push away some dreadful object. The most frequent gesture, as far as can be inferred from the action of persons who endeavor to express a vividly imagined scene of horror, is the raising of both shoulders, with the bent arms pressed closely against the sides or chest. These movements are nearly the same with those commonly made when we feel very cold, and they are generally accompanied by a shudder, as well as a deep expiration or inspiration, according as the chest happens at the time to be expanded or contracted. The sounds thus made are expressed by words like uh or ugh. It is not, however, obvious why, when we feel cold or express a sense of horror, we press our bent arms against our bodies, raise our shoulders, and shudder. Conclusion I have now endeavored to describe the diversified expressions of fear, in its gradations from mere attention to a start of surprise, into extreme terror and horror. Some of the signs may be accounted for through the principles of habit, association, and inheritance, such as the wide opening of the mouth and eyes with upraised eyebrows, so as to see as quickly as possible all around us and to hear distinctly whatever sound may reach our ears. For we have thus habitually prepared ourselves to discover and encounter any danger. Some of the other signs of fear may likewise be accounted for, at least in part, through these same principles. Men, during numberless generations, have endeavored to escape from their enemies or danger by headlong flight, or by violently struggling with them, and such great exertions will have caused the heart to beat rapidly, the breathing to be hurried, the chest to heave, and the nostrils to be dilated. As these exertions have often been prolonged to the last extremity, the final result will have been utter prostration, pallor, perspiration, trembling of all the muscles, or their complete relaxation. And now, whenever the emotion of fear is strongly felt, though it may not lead to any exertion, the same results tend to reappear through the force of inheritance and association. Nevertheless, it is probable that many or most of the above symptoms of terror, such as the beating of the heart, the trembling of the muscles, cold perspiration, etc., are in large part directly due to the disturbed or interrupted transmission of nerve force from the cerebrospinal system to various parts of the body, owing to the mind being so powerfully affected. We may confidently look to this cause, independently of habit and association, in such cases as the modified secretions of the intestinal canal and the failure of certain glands to act. With respect to the involuntary bristling of the hair, we have good reason to believe that in the case of animals this action, however it may have originated, serves, together with certain voluntary movements, to make them appear terrible to their enemies. And as the same involuntary and voluntary actions are performed by animals nearly related to man, we are led to believe that man has retained through inheritance a relic of them, now become useless. It is certainly a remarkable fact that the minute unstriped muscles by which the hairs thinly scattered over a man's almost naked body are erected should have been preserved to the present day 
and that they should still contract under the same emotions, namely terror and rage, which cause the hairs to stand on end in the lower members of the order to which man belongs. End of section 22. Section 23 of The Expressions of the Emotions in Man and Animals. Chapter 13. Self-attention. Shame. Shyness. Modesty. Blushing. Nature of a Blush. Inheritance. The parts of the body most affected. Blushing in the various races of man. Accompanying gestures. Confusion of mind. Causes of blushing. Self-attention. The fundamental element. Shyness. Shame from broken moral laws and conventional rules. Modesty. Theory of blushing. Recapitulation. Blushing is the most peculiar and the most human of all expressions. Monkeys redden from passion. But it will require an overwhelming amount of evidence to make us believe that any animal could blush. The reddening of the face from a blush is due to the relaxation of the muscular coats of the small arteries, by which the capillaries become filled with blood. And this depends on the proper vasomotor center being affected. No doubt if there be at the same time much mental agitation, the general circulation will be affected. But it is not due to the action of the heart that the network of minute vessels covering the face becomes under a sense of shame gorged with blood. We can cause laughing by tickling the skin, weeping or frowning by a blow, trembling from the fear of pain, and so forth. But we cannot cause a blush, as Dr. Burgess remarks, by any physical means. That is by any action on the body. It is the mind which must be affected. Blushing is not only involuntary, but the wish to restrain it by leading to self-attention actually increases the tendency. The young blush much more freely than the old, but not during infancy, which is remarkable as we know that infants at a very early age redden from passion. I have received authentic accounts of two little girls blushing at the ages of between two and three years, and of another sensitive child, a year older, blushing when reproved for a fault. Many children at a somewhat more advanced age blush in a strongly marked manner. It appears that the mental powers of infants are not as yet sufficiently developed to allow of their blushing. Hence also it is that idiots rarely blush. Dr. Crichton Brown observed for me those under his care, but never saw a genuine blush, though he has seen their faces flash, apparently from joy, when food was placed before them, and from anger. Nevertheless some, if not utterly degraded, are capable of blushing. A microcephalous idiot, for instance, thirteen years old, whose eyes brightened a little when he was pleased or amused, has been described by Dr. Ben as blushing and turning to one side when undressed for medical examination. Women blush much more than men. It is rare to see an old man, but not nearly so rare to see an old woman blushing. The blind do not escape. Laura Bridgman, born in this condition, as well as completely deaf, blushes. The Reverend R. H. Blair, principal of the Worcester College, informs me that three children born blind out of seven or eight then in the asylum are great blushers. The blind are not at first conscious that they are observed, and it is the most important part of their education, as Mr. Blair informs me, to impress this knowledge on their minds and the impression thus gained would greatly strengthen the tendency to blush by increasing the habit of self-attention. The tendency to blush is inherited. Dr. Burgess gives the case of a family consisting of a father, mother, and ten children, all of whom, without exception, were prone to blush to a most painful degree. 
the children were grown up, and some of them were sent to travel in order to wear away this diseased sensibility. But nothing was of the slightest avail. Even peculiarities in blushing seemed to be inherited. Sir James Paget, whilst examining the spine of a girl, was struck at her singular manner of blushing. A big splash of red appeared first on one cheek, and then other splashes variously scattered over the face and neck. He subsequently asked the mother whether her daughter always blushed in this peculiar manner, and was answered, Yes, she takes after me. Sir J. Paget then perceived that by asking this question he had caused the mother to blush, and she exhibited the same peculiarity as her daughter. In most cases the face, ears, and neck are the sole parts which redden. But many persons, whilst blushing intensely, feel that their whole bodies grow hot and tingle, and this shows that the entire surface must be in some manner affected. Blushes are said sometimes to commence on the forehead, but more commonly on the cheeks, afterwards spreading to the ears and neck. In two albinos examined by Dr. Burgess, the blushes commenced by a small circumscribed spot on the cheeks, over the parotidian plexus of nerves, and then increased into a circle. Between this blushing circle and the blush on the neck, there was an evident line of demarcation, although both arose simultaneously. The retina, which is naturally red in the albino, invariably increased at the same time in redness. Everyone must have noticed how easily after one blush, fresh blushes chase each other over the face. Blushing is preceded by a peculiar sensation in the skin. According to Dr. Burgess, the reddening of the skin is generally succeeded by a slight pallor, which shows that the capillary vessels contract after dilating. In some rare cases, paleness instead of redness is caused under conditions which would naturally induce a blush. For instance, a young lady told me that in a large and crowded party she caught her hair so firmly on the button of a passing servant that it took some time before she could be extricated. From her sensations she imagined that she had blushed crimson, but was assured by a friend that she had turned extremely pale. I was desirous to learn how far down the body blushes extend, and Sir J. Paget who necessarily has frequent opportunities for observation, has kindly attended to this point for me during two or three years. He finds that, with women who blush intensely on the face, ears, and nape of neck, the blush does not commonly extend any lower down the body. It is rare to see it as low down as the collar bones and shoulder blades, and he has never himself seen a single instance in which it extended below the upper part of the chest. He has also noticed that blushes sometimes die away downwards, not gradually and insensibly, but by irregular, ruddy blotches. Dr. Langstaff has likewise observed for me several women whose bodies did not in the least redden while their faces were crimsoned with blushes. With the insane, some of whom appear to be particularly liable to blushing, Dr. J. Crichton Brown has several times seen the blush extend as far down as the collar bones, and in two instances to the breast. He gives me the case of a married woman, aged 27, who suffered from epilepsy. On the morning after her arrival in the asylum, Dr. Brown, together with his assistants, visited her while she was in bed. The moment that he approached, she blushed deeply over her cheeks and temples, and the blush spread quickly to her ears. She was much agitated and tremulous. He unfastened the collar of her chemise in order to examine the state of her lungs, and then a brilliant blush rushed over her chest in an arch line over the upper third of each breast, and extended downwards between the breaths nearly to the ensiform cartilage of the sternum. 
This case is interesting, as the blush did not thus extend downwards until it became intense by her attention being drawn to this part of her person. As the examination proceeded, she became composed, and the blush disappeared. But on several subsequent occasions, the same phenomena were observed. The foregoing facts show that, as a general rule, with English women, blushing does not extend beneath the neck and upper part of the chest. Nevertheless, Sir J. Paget informs me that he has lately heard of a case on which he can fully rely in which a little girl, shocked by what she imagined to be an act of indelicacy, blushed all over her abdomen and the upper parts of her legs. Moreau also relates on the authority of a celebrated painter that the chest, shoulders, arms, and whole body of a girl who unwillingly consented to serve as a model reddened when she was first divested of her clothes. It is a rather curious question why, in most cases, the face, ears, and neck alone redden, inasmuch as the whole surface of the body often tingles and grows hot. It seems to depend chiefly on the face and adjoining parts of the skin having been habitually exposed to the air, light, and alternations of temperature, by which the small arteries not only have acquired the habit of readily dilating and contracting, but appear to have unusually developed in comparison with other parts of the surface. It is probably owing to the same cause as Monsieur Moreau and Dr. Burgess have remarked, that the face is so liable to redden under various circumstances, such as fever fit, ordinary heat, violent exertion, anger, a slight blow, etc. And on the other hand, that it is liable to grow pale from cold and fear, and to be discolored during pregnancy. The face is also particularly liable to be affected by cutaneous complaints, by smallpox, erysipelas, etc. This view is likewise supported by the fact that the men of certain races who habitually go nearly naked often blush over their arms and chests and even down to their waists. A lady, who is a great blusher, informs Dr. Crichton Brown that when she feels ashamed or is agitated, she blushes over her face, neck, wrists, and hands, that is, over all the exposed portions of her skin. Nevertheless, it may be doubted whether the habitual exposure of the skin, of the face and neck, and its consequent power of reaction under stimulants of all kinds, is by itself sufficient to account for the much greater tendency in English women of these parts than of others to blush. For the hands are well supplied with nerves and small vessels, and have been as much exposed to the air as the face or neck and yet the hands rarely blush. We shall presently see that the attention of the mind having been directed much more frequently and earnestly to the face than to any other part of the body probably affords a sufficient explanation. Blushing in the Various Races of Man The small vessels of the face become filled with blood from the emotion of shame in almost all the races of man though in the very dark races no distinct change of color can be perceived. Blushing is evident in all the Aryan nations of Europe, and to a certain extent with those of India. But Mr. Erskine has never noticed that the necks of the Hindus are decidedly affected. With the Lepchas of Sikkim, Mr. Scott has often observed a faint blush on the cheeks, base of the ears, and sides of the neck, accompanied by sunken eyes and lowered head. This has occurred when he has detected them in a falsehood, or has accused them of ingratitude. The pale, sallow complexions of these men render a blush much more conspicuous than in most of the other natives of India. With the latter, shame, or it may be in part fear, is expressed, according to Mr. Scott, much more plainly by the head being averted or bent down, with the eyes wavering or turned askant, than by any change of color in the skin. The Semitic races blush freely, as might have been expected, from their general similitude to the Aryans. Thus with the Jews, it is said in the book of Jeremiah, 
Chapter 6, 15 Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Mrs. Asa Gray saw an Arab managing his boat clumsily on the Nile, and when laughed at by his companions, he blushed quite to the back of his neck. Lady Duff Gordon remarks that a young Arab blushed on coming into her presence. Mr. Swinhoe has seen the Chinese blushing, but he thinks it is rare, yet they have the expression to redden with shame. Mr. Geech informs me that the Chinese settled in Malacca and the native Malays of the interior both blush. Some of these people go nearly naked, and he particularly attended to the downward extension of the blush. Omitting the cases in which the face alone was seen to blush, Mr. Geech observed that the face, arms, and breasts of a Chinaman, aged 24 years, reddened from shame. And with another Chinese, when asked why he had not done his work in better style, the whole body was similarly affected. In two Malays, he saw the face, neck, breast, and arms blushing. And in a third Malay, a Bugis, the blush extended down to the waist. The Polynesians blush freely. The Reverend Mr. Stack has seen hundreds of instances with the New Zealanders. The following case is worth giving, as it relates to an old man who was unusually dark-colored and partly tattooed. After having let his land to an Englishman for a small yearly rental, a strong passion seized him to buy a gig, which had lately become the fashion with the Maoris. He consequently wished to draw all the rent for four years from his tenant and consulted Mr. Stack whether he could do so. The man was old, clumsy, poor, and ragged, and the idea of his driving himself about in his carriage for display amused Mr. Stack so much that he could not help bursting out into a laugh. And then the old man blushed up to the roots of his hair. Forster says that you may easily distinguish a spreading blush on the cheeks of the fairest women in Tahiti. The natives, also of several of the other archipelagos in the Pacific, have been seen to blush. Mr. Washington Matthews has often seen a blush on the faces of the young squalls belonging to various wild Indian tribes of North America. At the opposite extremity of the continent in Tierra del Fuego, the natives, according to Mr. Bridges, blush much but chiefly in regard to women, but they certainly blush also at their own personal appearance. This latter statement agrees with what I remember of the Fujian, Jemmy Button, who blushed when he was quizzed about the care which he took in polishing his shoes, and in otherwise adorning himself. With respect to the Aymara Indians on the lofty plateaus of Bolivia, Mr. Forbes say that from the color of their skins it is impossible that their blushes should be as clearly visible as in the white races, still under such circumstances as would raise a blush in us. There can always be seen the same expression of modesty or confusion, and even in the dark, a rise of temperature of the skin of the face can be felt, exactly as occurs in the European. With the Indians, who inhabit the hot, equable, and damp parts of South America, the skin apparently does not answer to mental excitement so readily as with the natives of the northern and southern parts of the continent who have long been exposed to great vicissitudes of climate. For Humboldt quotes without a protest the sneer of the Spaniard. How can those be trusted who know not how to blush? Von Spix and Martius, in speaking of the aborigines of Brazil, assert that they cannot properly be said to blush. It was only after long intercourse with the whites, and after receiving some education, that we perceived in the Indians a change of color expressive of the emotions of their minds. It is, however, incredible that the power of blushing could have thus originated. But the habit of self-attention, consequent on their education and new course of life, would have much increased any innate tendency to blush. Several trustworthy observers have assured me that they have seen on the faces of negroes an appearance resembling a blush under circumstances which would have excited one in us, 
though their skins were of an ebony black tint. Some describe it as blushing brown, but most say that the blackness becomes more intense. An increased supply of blood in the skin seems in some manner to increase its blackness. Thus, certain exanthematous diseases cause the affected places in the negro to appear blacker, instead of, as with us, redder. The skin, perhaps from being rendered more tense by the filling of the capillaries, would reflect a somewhat different tint to what it did before. That the capillaries of the face in the negro become filled with blood, under the emotion of shame, we may feel confident, because a perfectly characterized albino negress, described by Buffon, showed a faint tinge of crimson on her cheeks when she exhibited herself naked. Cicatrices of the skin remained for a long time white in the negro, and Dr. Burgess, who had frequent opportunities of observing a scar of this kind on the face of a negress, distinctly saw that it invariably became red whenever she was abruptly spoken to, or charged with any trivial offence. The blush could be seen proceeding from the circumference of the scar towards the middle, but it did not reach the centre. Mulattoes are often great blushers, blush succeeding blush over their faces. From these facts there can be no doubt that negroes blush, although no redness is visible on the skin. I am assured by Gaika and by Mrs. Barber that the Kaffirs of South Africa never blush, but this may only mean that no change of color is distinguishable. Gaika adds that under the circumstances which would make a European blush, his countrymen looked ashamed to keep their heads up. It is asserted by four of my informants that the Australians, who are almost as black as Negroes, never blush. A fifth answered doubtfully, remarking that only a very strong blush could be seen on account of the dirty state of their skins. Three observers state that they do blush. Mr. S. Wilson adding that this is noticeable only under a strong emotion, and when the skin is not too dark from long exposure and want of cleanliness. Mr. Lang answers, I have noticed that shame almost always excites a blush, which frequently extends as low as the neck. Shame is also shown, as he adds, by the eyes being turned from side to side. As Mr. Lang was a teacher in a native school, it is probable that he chiefly observed children, and we know that they blush more than adults. Mr. G. Taplin has seen half-castes blushing, and he says that the aborigines have a word expressive of shame. Mr. Hagenoyer, who is one of those who has never observed the Australians to blush, says that he has seen them looking down to the ground on account of shame. And the missionary, Mr. Bulmer, remarks that though I have not been able to detect anything like shame in the adult aborigines, I have noticed that the eyes of the children, when ashamed, present a restless, watery appearance, as if they did not know where to look. The facts now given are sufficient to show that blushing, whether or not there is any change of color, is common to most, probably to all, of the races of man. Movements and gestures which accompany blushing. Under a keen sense of shame, there is a strong desire for concealment. We turn away the whole body, more especially the face, which we endeavor in some manner to hide. An ashamed person can hardly endure to meet the gaze of those present, so that he almost invariably casts down his eye or look askant. As there generally exists at the same time a strong wish to avoid the appearance of shame, a vain attempt is made to look direct at the person who causes this feeling, and the antagonism between these opposite tendencies lead to various restless movements in the eyes. I have noticed two ladies who, whilst blushing, to which they are very liable, have thus acquired, as it appears, the oddest trick of incessantly blinking their eyelids with extraordinary rapidity. An intense blush is sometimes accompanied by a slight effusion of tears. And this, 
I presume, is due to the lacrimal glands partaking of the increased supply of blood, which we know rushes into the capillaries of the adjoining parts, including the retina. Many writers, ancient and modern, have noticed the foregoing movements, and it has already been shown that the aborigines in various parts of the world often exhibit their shame by looking downwards, or asking, or by restless movements of their eyes. Ezra cries out, Chapter 9, 6 O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my head to thee, my God. In Isaiah, Chapter 1, 6, we meet with the words, I hid not my face from shame. Seneca remarks, Epistle 11, 5, that the Roman players hang down their heads, fix their eyes on the ground, and keep them lowered, but are unable to blush in acting shame. According to Macrobius, who lived in the 5th century, Saturnalia, B, 7, C, 11. Natural philosophers assert that nature, being moved by shame, spreads the blood before herself as a veil. As we see any one blushing often put his hands before his face. Shakespeare makes Marcus, Titus Andronicus, Act 2, Scene 5, say to his knees, Ah, now thou turns away thy face for shame. A lady informs me that she found in the lock hospital a girl whom she had formerly known and who had become a wretched castaway, and the poor creature, when approached, hid her face under the bedclothes and could not be persuaded to uncover it. We often see little children, when shy or ashamed, turn away and still standing up, bury their faces in their mother's gown, or they throw themselves face downwards on her lap. End of section 23. Section 24 of the expression of the emotions in man and animals. Chapter 13. Self-attention, shame, shyness, modesty, blushing, continued. Part 2. Confusion of mind. Most persons, whilst blushing intensely, have their mental powers confused. This is recognized in such common expressions as, she was covered with confusion. Persons in this condition lose their presence of mind and utter singularly inappropriate remarks. They are often much distressed, stammer, and make awkward movements or strange grimaces. In certain cases, involuntarily twitchings of some of the facial muscles may be observed. I have been informed by a young lady, who blushes excessively, that at such times she does not even know what she is saying. When it was suggested to her that this might be due to her distress from the consciousness that her blushing was noticed, she answered that this could not be the case, as she had sometimes felt quite as stupid when blushing at a thought in her own room. I will give an instance of the extreme disturbance of mind to which some sensitive men are liable. A gentleman, on whom I can rely, assured me that he had been an eyewitness of the following scene. A small dinner party was given in honor of an extremely shy man who, when he rose to return thanks, rehearsed the speech, which he had evidently learned by heart, in absolute silence and did not utter a single word. But he acted as if he were speaking with much emphasis. His friends, perceiving how the case stood, loudly applauded the imaginary burst of eloquence whenever his gestures indicated a pause and the man never discovered that he had remained the whole time completely silent. On the contrary, he afterwards remarked to my friend, with much satisfaction, that he thought he had succeeded uncommonly well. When a person is much ashamed or very shy and blushes intensely, his heart beats rapidly and his breathing is disturbed. This can hardly fail to affect the circulation of the blood within the brain, and perhaps the mental powers. It seems, however, doubtful, judging from the still more powerful influence of anger and fear on the circulation, whether we can thus satisfactorily account for the confused state of mind in persons whilst blushing intensely. The true explanation apparently lies in the intimate sympathy which exists between the capillary circulation of the surface of the head and face and that of the brain. 
On applying to Dr. J. Crichton Brown for information, he has given me various facts bearing on this subject. When the sympathetic nerve is divided on one side of the head, the capillaries on this side are relaxed and become filled with blood, causing the skin to redden and grow hot, and at the same time the temperature within the cranium on the same side rises. Inflammation of the membranes of the brain leads to the engorgement of the face, ears, and eyes with blood. The first stage of an epileptic fit appears to be the contraction of the vessels of the brain, and the first outward manifestation is an extreme pallor of countenance. Erysipelas of the head commonly induces delirium. Even the relief given to a severe headache by burning the skin with strong lotion depends, I presume, on the same principle. Dr. Brown has often administered to his patients the vapor of the nitrite of amyl, which has the singular property of causing vivid redness of the face in from 30 to 60 seconds. This flushing resembles blushing in almost every detail. It begins at several distinct points on the face and spreads till it involves the whole surface of the head, neck, and front of the chest, but has been observed to extend only in one case to the abdomen. The arteries in the retina becomes enlarged, the eyes glisten, and in one instance there was a slight effusion of tears. The patients are at first pleasantly stimulated, but as the flushing increases, they become confused and bewildered. One woman, to whom the vapor had often been administered, asserted that, as soon as she grew hot, she grew muddled. With persons just commencing to blush, it appears, judging from their bright eyes and lively behavior, that their mental powers are somewhat stimulated. It is only when the blushing is excessive that the mind grows confused. Therefore, it would seem that the capillaries of the face are affected both during the inhalation of the nitrite of amyl and during blushing, before that part of the brain is affected on which the mental powers depend. Conversely, when the brain is primarily affected, the circulation of the skin is so in a secondary manner. Dr. Brown has frequently observed, as he informs me, scattered red blotches and mottlings on the chest of epileptic patients. In these cases, when the skin on the thorax or abdomen is gently rubbed with a pencil or other object, or in strongly marked cases is merely touched by the finger, the surface becomes suffused in less than half a minute with bright red marks, which spread to some distance on each side of the touched point, and persists for several minutes. These are the cerebral maculae of Trousseau, and they indicate, as Dr. Brown remarks, a highly modified condition of the cutaneous vascular system. If then there exists, as cannot be doubted, an intimate sympathy between the capillary circulation in that part of the brain on which our mental powers depend, and in the skin of the face, it is not surprising that the moral causes which induce intense blushing should likewise induce, independently of their own disturbing influence, much confusion of mind. The nature of the mental states which induce blushing. These consist of shyness, shame, and modesty. The essential element in all being self-attention. Many reasons can be assigned for believing that originally self-attention directed to personal appearance in relation to the opinion of others was the exciting cause, the same effect being subsequently produced through the force of association by self-attention in relation to moral conduct. It is not the simple act of reflecting on our own appearance, but the thinking what others think of us, which excites a blush. In absolute solitude, the most sensitive person would be quite indifferent about his appearance. We feel blame or disapprobation more acutely than approbation, and consequently depreciatory remarks or ridicule, whether our appearance or conduct causes us to blush much more readily than does praise. But undoubtedly, praise and admiration are highly efficient. A pretty girl blushes when a man gazes intently at her, though she may know perfectly well that he is not depreciating her. Many children, as well as old and sensitive persons, blush when they are much praised. Hereafter, the question will be discussed how it has arisen that the consciousness that others are attending to our personal appearance should have led to the capillaries, especially those of the face, 
instantly becoming filled with blood. My reasons for believing that attention directed to personal appearance and not to moral conduct has been the fundamental element in the acquirement of the habit of blushing will now be given. They are separately light, but combined possesses, as it appears to me, considerable weight. It is notorious that nothing makes a shy person blush so much as any remark, however slight, on his personal appearance. One cannot notice even the dress of a woman much given to blushing without causing her face to crimson. It is sufficient to stare hard at some person to make them, as Coleridge remarks, blush, account for that he who can. With the two albinos observed by Dr. Burgess, the slightest attempt to examine their peculiarities invariably caused them to blush deeply. Women are much more sensitive about their personal appearance than men are, especially elderly women in comparison with elderly men, and they blush much more freely. The young of both sexes are much more sensitive on the same head than the old, and they also blush much more freely than the old. Children at a very early age do not blush, nor do they show those other signs of self-consciousness which generally accompany blushing. And it is one of their chief charms that they think nothing about what others think of them. At this early age, they will stare at a stranger with a fixed gaze and unblinking eyes, as on an inanimate object, in a manner which we elders cannot imitate. It is plain to everyone that young men and women are highly sensitive to the opinion of each other with reference to their personal appearance, and they blush incomparably more in the presence of the opposite sex than in that of their own. A young man, not very liable to blush, will blush intensely at any slight ridicule of his appearance from a girl whose judgment on any important subject lie with disregard. No happy pair of young lovers, valuing each other's admiration and love more than anything else in the world, probably ever courted each other without many a blush. Even the barbarians of Tierra del Fuego, according to Mr. Bridges, blush chiefly in regard to women, but certainly also at their own personal appearance. Of all parts of the body, the face is most considered and regarded as is natural from its being the chief seat of expression and the source of the voice. It is also the chief seat of beauty and of ugliness, and throughout the world is the most ornamented. The face, therefore, will have been subjected during many generations to much closer and more earnest self-attention than any other part of the body. And in accordance with the principle here advanced, we can understand why it should be the most liable to blush, Although exposure to alternations of temperature and etc. has probably much increased the power of dilatation and contraction in the capillaries of the face and adjoining parts, yet this by itself will hardly account for these parts blushing much more than the rest of the body. For it does not explain the fact of the hands rarely blushing. With Europeans, the whole body tingles slightly when the face blushes intensely, and with the races of men who habitually go nearly naked, the blushes extend over a much larger surface than with us. These facts are, to a certain extent, intelligible, as the self-attention of primeval man, as well as of the existing races which still go naked, will not have been so exclusively confined to their faces, as is the case with the people who now go clothed. We have seen that in all parts of the world, persons who feel shame for some moral delinquency are apt to avert, bend down, or hide their faces, independently of any thought about their personal appearance. The object can hardly be to conceal their blushes, for the face is thus averted or hidden under circumstances which exclude any desire to conceal shame, as when guilt is fully confessed and repented of. It is, however, probable that primeval man, before he had acquired much moral sensitiveness, would have been highly sensitive about his personal appearance, at least in reference to the other sex, and he would consequently have felt distress at any depreciatory remarks about his appearance. And this is one form of shame. And as the face is the part of the body which is most regarded, it is intelligible that any one ashamed of his personal appearance would desire to conceal this part of his body. 
The habit, having been thus acquired, would naturally be carried on when shame from strictly moral causes was felt, and it is not easy otherwise to see why under these circumstances there should be a desire to hide the face more than any other part of the body. The habit, so general with everyone who feels ashamed of turning away or lowering his eyes or restlessly moving them from side to side, probably follows from each glance directed towards those present, bringing home the conviction that he is intently regarded. And he endeavors, by not looking at those present, and especially not at their eyes, momentarily to escape from this painful conviction. Shyness. This odd state of mind, often called shamefacedness, or false shame, or mauvaise honte, appears to be one of the most efficient of all the causes of blushing. Shyness is, indeed, chiefly recognized by the face reddening, by the eyes being averted or cast down, and by awkward nervous movements of the body. Many a woman blushes from this cause a hundred, perhaps a thousand times, to once that she blushes from having done anything deserving blame, and of which she is truly ashamed. Shyness seems to depend on sensitiveness to the opinion, whether good or bad, of others, more especially with respect to external appearance. Strangers neither know nor care anything about our conduct or character, but they may, and often do, criticize our appearance. Hence shy persons are particularly apt to be shy and to blush in the presence of strangers. The consciousness of anything peculiar or even new in the dress or any slight blemish on the person, and more especially on the face, points which are likely to attract the attention of strangers, makes the shy intolerably shy. On the other hand, in those cases in which conduct and not personal appearance is concerned, we are much more apt to be shy in the presence of acquaintances, whose judgment we in some degree value, than in that of strangers. A physician told me that a young man, a wealthy duke, with whom he had travelled as medical attendant, blushed like a girl when he paid him his fee. Yet this young man probably would not have blushed and been shy had he been paying a bill to a tradesman. Some persons, however, are so sensitive that the mere act of speaking to almost anyone is sufficient to rouse their self-consciousness, and a slight blush is the result. This approbation or ridicule, from our sensitiveness on this head, causes shyness and blushing much more readily than this approbation, though the latter with some persons is highly efficient. The conceited are rarely shy, for they value themselves much too highly to expect depreciation. Why a proud man is often shy, as appears to be the case, is not so obvious, unless it be that, with all his self-reliance, he really thinks much about the opinion of others, although in a disdainful spirit. Persons who are exceedingly shy are rarely shy in the presence of those with whom they are quite familiar, and of whose good opinion and sympathy they are perfectly assured. For instance, a girl in the presence of her mother. I neglected to inquire in my printed paper whether shyness can be detected in the different races of man, but a Hindu gentleman assured Mr. Erskine that it is recognizable in his countrymen. Shyness, as the derivation of the word indicates in several languages, is closely related to fear. Yet it is distinct from fear in the ordinary sense. A shy man no doubt dreads the notice of strangers, but can hardly be said to be afraid of them. He may be as bold as a hero in battle, and yet have no self-confidence about trifles in the presence of strangers. Almost every one is extremely nervous when first addressing a public assembly, and most men remain so throughout their lives. But this appears to depend on the consciousness of a great coming exertion, with its associated effects on the system, rather than on shyness. Although a timid or shy man no doubt suffers on such occasions indefinitely more than another. With very young children, it is difficult to distinguish between fear and shyness, 
but this latter feeling with them has often seemed to me to partake of the character of the wildness of an untamed animal. Shyness comes on at a very early age. In one of my own children, when two years and three months old, I saw a trace of what certainly appeared to be shyness directed towards myself after an absence from home of only a week. This was shown not only by a blush, but by the eyes being for a few minutes slightly averted from me. I have noticed on other occasions that shyness or shamefacedness and real shame are exhibited in the eyes of young children before they have acquired the power of blushing. As shyness apparently depends on self-attention, we can perceive how right are those who maintain that reprehending children for shyness instead of doing them any good does much harm as it calls their attention still more closely to themselves. It has been well urged that nothing hurts young people more than to be watched continually about their feelings, to have their countenances scrutinized, and the degrees of their sensibility measured by the surveying eye of the unmerciful spectator. Under the constraint of such examinations, they can think of nothing but that they are looked at, and feel nothing but shame or apprehension. Moral Causes Guilt with respect to blushing from strictly moral causes, we meet with the same fundamental principle as before, namely, regard for the opinion of others. It is not the conscience which raises a blush, for a man may sincerely regret some slight fault committed in solitude, or he may suffer the deepest remorse for an undetected crime, but he will not blush. I blush, says Dr. Burgess, in the presence of my accusers. It is not the sense of guilt, but the thought that others think or know us to be guilty, which crimsons the face. A man may feel thoroughly ashamed at having told a small falsehood without blushing, but if he even suspects that he is detected, he will instantly blush, especially if detected by one whom he reveres. On the other hand, a man may be convinced that God witnesses all his actions, and he may feel deeply conscious of some fault and pray for forgiveness, but this will not, as a lady who is a great blusher believes, ever excite a blush. The explanation of this difference between the knowledge by God and man of her action lies, I presume, in man's disapprobation of immoral conduct, being somewhat akin in nature to his depreciation of our personal appearance, so that through association both lead to similar results, whereas the disapprobation of God brings up no such association. Many a person has blushed intensely when accused of some crime, though completely innocent of it. Even the thought, as the lady before referred to has observed to me, that others think that we have made an unkind or stupid remark is amply sufficient to cause a blush, although we know all the time that we have been completely misunderstood. An action may be meritorious or of an indifferent nature, but a sensitive person, if he suspects that others take a different view of it, will blush. For instance, a lady by herself may give money to a beggar without a trace of a blush, but if others are present and she doubts whether they approve or suspects that they think her influenced by display, she will blush. So it will be if she offers to relieve the distress of a decayed gentlewoman more particularly of one whom she had previously known under better circumstances, as she cannot then feel sure how her conduct will be viewed. But such cases as these blend into shyness. Breaches of Etiquette The rules of etiquette always refers to conduct in the presence of or towards others. They have no necessary connection with the moral sense and are often meaningless. Nevertheless, as they depend on the fixed custom of our equals and superiors, whose opinion we highly regard, they are considered almost as binding as are the laws of honor to a gentleman. Consequently, the breach of the laws of etiquette, that is, any impoliteness or gaucherie, any impropriety, 
or an inappropriate remark, though quite accidental, will cause the most intense blushing of which a man is capable. Even the recollection of such an act, after an interval of many years, will make the whole body to tingle. So strong, also, is the power of sympathy that a sensitive person, as a lady has assured me, will sometimes blush at a flagrant breach of etiquette by a perfect stranger, though the act may in no way concern her. End of section 24